Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, my name is uh, Ines Envid. I'm a product manager in cloud networking, working in many things, uh, among others, uh, GK on-prem, part of our uh, Anthos uh, announcement and launch in this, uh, in this next. And I'm going to have the pleasure of uh, having with me uh, Satya, who's uh, the lead engineer for uh, GK on-prem uh, networking, and uh, Paul and Scott, who we've been working very closely on the GK on-prem uh, in, uh, in the last month. And, you know, I'll go really quick, because who wants to listen to a product manager when you've got the real people? So uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, how we're seeing the GKE evolution, what it means to our offering, and why it is such an important piece of what we do um, in, in Google Cloud. So you are very familiar with uh, containers. You know that you know, we've been working uh, on uh, and the industry, and open source has been um, uh, working on container racing applications, and that allows us to extract the uh, infrastructure resources. And Kubernetes really has become, in that journey, the de facto orchestrator for the containerized um, applications. So it has many advantages. Uh, it allows to modernize applications. It uh, provides the portability uh, so that you can actually uh, develop your applications and then you can port and deploy very fundamental on how we as Google see the public cloud and you know our uh, um, view that uh, it should be uh, multi-cloud, it should be open, it should be portable. So why Kubernetes uh, has been so successful? So it really provides um, uh, the capabilities of um, not only orchestrating your applications at your workloads, but it provides certain properties that make it very appealing. So you have um, uh, a stable IP for your services. You, you're able to deploy your applications within the cluster and then provide a stable IP and stable communication to the external world, but internally, the pod IPs and the pods that are used for serving that application are uh, ephemeral, so that gives you the flexibility while serving the applications to the external world, it is stable. Uh, now it provides you as well with the flexibility of delivering layer four services, uh, delivering ingress services through uh, layer seven capabilities. Uh, we as uh, um, 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 the implementation of uh, Kubernetes uh, have been uh, uh, delivering um, pod IPs as first class uh, citizens so that they are routable um, uh, to the pods. Now, as part of your deployments as well, you have the capability of having policies and then you're able to declare uh, that certain applications are able to communicate with others and uh, that are, those are network policies as well, as standardized uh, APIs that you can use for declaring your intentions of communication, your, uh, of communicating your, your applications. And then you can do so as well uh, within the clusters and then certain, have certain applications that are exposed to the external world, some others that uh, are only uh, made available internally and only through the paths uh, and the, uh, from the applications that are uh, meaningful to that communication. So now uh, we as uh, uh, Google Cloud have been uh, uh, delivering solutions for uh, Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes has been a game changer for developers. It really provides the uh, de facto way of uh, modernizing uh, applications. Now, Obviously, it's been very successful for developers because all this flexibility and portability that it provides. Now, the issue is when you are delivering these applications and you are doing it for production environments, you still have the day two operations to care about. So you need to care about managing the components. You need to care about uh, upgrading uh, the nodes and the cluster, you need to care about 
auto scaling, providing high availability, auto repairs. And therefore, we felt that part of the problem statement has not really been solved with Kubernetes. Uh, so now, what we have been working really hard in the last few years is delivering you know, the solution for the second part of the problem. Now, we want to deliver a solution that is providing the manageability of the uh, cluster with upgrades, with auto repairs, with auto scaling, and that is really the beauty of GKE. It is really uh, the solution not only for your developers, but also for the system platform operator. So it really takes the journey of Kubernetes from a developer tool to an enterprise ready solution to be deployed for your production environments. Now, as you can see, you know, we've been delivering solutions for high availability, so then you can have SLAs as part of your deployments. Uh, for example, we've been providing high availability not only for the cluster, but also for the master with regional master so that you can have availability in data plane, in control plane. We provide auto patching, you know, for example, taking care of vulnerability, uh, security vulnerability um, issues. We provide auto repair. We provide auto scaling. We provide, for example, solutions for managed TLS uh, certificates. So you can think of it of a complete end-to-end uh, -end, uh, enterprise-ready solution. And we really see this as a fundamental platform for us to deliver the capabilities of our cloud to our customers. So the growth of GKE in Google Cloud has been enormous, and we'll just see more and more enterprises really taking advantage of the agility of containers combined with the uh, manageability of the platform itself and the security capabilities, the auto-managed capabilities that the platform provides. But, you know, the journey does not end there. Uh, we've been very busy adding more value. What is that value? As we are delivering the uh, GKE as the game changer for the platform operator, we are doing so not only on our platform, but also for your on-prem environment. It's been really something that uh, many enterprises uh, have been asking us to do. They want to see the capabilities of GKE, the manageability, the readiness, uh, the security, not only for the cloud environments, but also for their on-prem environments. And you know, we're going to have uh, Scott and Paul talking about why that is important, and there are many reasons why you know, enterprises might not be able to deploy certain applications in the cloud. But what we are doing is providing the same principles that we have in our cloud in on-prem. So what does that mean? We mean that we are able to provide clusters that are able to be grouped and able to be controlled and managed. There is an administration cluster. There are control plane that runs on-prem so that you actually have a standalone uh, operating cluster on-prem, whether there is connectivity or not to cloud. But it gets uh, automatically started up, uh, it has um, um, connectivity with the registry that runs as well locally, so that it starts up and then it gets registered in the cloud so that we 
have the credentials, we have the security on a single pane of glass for visibility. It shows in our cloud console, and then you're able to really manage the functions of your cluster as you will do if it is in, GK, um, in GCP. Now, it is important again to know that we understand that the deployment needs to be operating in on-prem, so we've been very careful of offering the capabilities of running autonomously uh, in on-prem, uh, even though it has a register to the cloud for uh, manageability reasons, so that we can do up to upgrades, we can actually manage the cluster. And you know, the boring part is over. Uh, so more interesting, I want to uh, welcome on stage uh, Paul. Paul Revelo is uh, in HSBC. He's been a very trusted partner in all the journey, and he's going to talk more about why this is important for their deployments in HSBC. Thanks. Welcome, Paul. HSBC. Oh. On now? Yeah. Hey guys, uh, my name's Paul. Uh, I work at HSBC, um, an enterprise cloud architect there. My team is responsible for helping to set the cloud strategy at the bank. Uh, typically that means public cloud for us, but we are now building out uh, internal cloud capabilities as well. And we've uh, settled on Kubernetes to help us achieve that. Uh, a little bit about HSBC. Um, we're a very large organization. We're spread out globally. Large number of IT professionals. Um, and we have all of the challenges that that typically brings uh, in large enterprises when it comes to infrastructure provisioning, application development, application deployment, uh, patch management. So, you know, when we started looking at this stuff, we. we we really had a list of, uh, of items that kind of have a long lead time typically at the bank, and we really wanted to fix them. So if you look at a standard application deployment in our enterprise, it's VM-based. Uh, VM-based applications require VMs to be deployed. Uh, we have an IaaS capability on-premise, but it's not necessarily uh, a rapid provisioning. It still has a lead time associated with it, it's a very static type of provisioning. You ask for something, you get that something. There's no real leeway there. If you need something else, you have to ask for something else later on down the road. Uh, moving to Kubernetes and GKE on-prem, uh, we can have pre-built infrastructure that supports the Kubernetes environment, and then we can give people uh, the ability to create images that they can deploy there and not have to wait for infrastructure to be provisioned to do that. That's a, a very big win for us um, it gives us the ability to really rapidly change the posture there. Uh, IP allocation is a problem that we normally have on premise when it comes to infrastructure provisioning. The reason that's an issue for us is it's a little bit of a manual process, but it's also a static thing, right? IPs are tied to many things in a typical VM application deployment. They're tied to DNS names, they're tied to maybe licensing, whatever it might be, right? There's a one-to-one there's a -one mapping there of something, usually. Uh, when we go to Kubernetes and we're running in island mode with GKE on-premise specifically, it gives us the ability to have a wildcard DNS entry and a single VIP on a load balancer that all of our applications can target that are running inside of that infrastructure. So you provision it once and it's good to go. DNS, again, wildcard to the cluster, same thing like I just mentioned. Rather than a manual provisioning process for DNS, there's a wildcard entry. Makes things much easier to deal with, much more faster, much easier to, to deploy applications. Configuring service. Again, typically, if you think of the life cycle of a VM-based application deployment, you request a VM, you get some information about that VM at some point in time, an IP address, a DNS name. You then need to go back to a second team and have them configure a load balancer for you. That's typically not under your control as an application developer in a large enterprise. That's something that a separate team handles on the infrastructure side. This eliminates that because you're now just using the ingress controller that's built into the Kubernetes environment. 
it's all handled as part of your application deployment. Very simple, very straightforward. Having a high availability control plane. This is an interesting one for us. Uh, we're in financial services. HA is very important to us. Getting HA for every piece of your infrastructure that supports your application deployments is a challenge. It's expensive. Moving to Kubernetes kind of solves that a little bit. And with GKE on-premise specifically, we have the ability to have highly available masters that are separate from the actual user clusters themselves. This is great for us. It gives us the ability to scale that independently, provide high availability there independently from the applications that are running. Um, day two operations. Inez touched on this a little bit, but this is a little bit more specific to the actual application deployments. So patches and upgrades, if you think about VMware-based deployments, how do you patch a VM? You have to patch a VM, right? Well, now you have 100,000 VMs. You have to patch 100,000 VMs. Upgrades, same thing. You want to do an OS upgrade? That's a major, major challenge in a large enterprise. With GKA on-premise, Kubernetes in general, you can do customer-initiated auto upgrades of the Kubernetes environment that have already been tested and approved by Google. It's not something that you need to necessarily do automatically, right? We're an enterprise. We wouldn't necessarily want something to upgrade automatically behind the scenes for us, but it can be customer initiated. There's a button that you can click to say, I want to upgrade right now. I want to upgrade at this time. Works very well for us. Reshaping infrastructure. I touched on this before. If you request a VM in a typical enterprise, it's a VM. If you need that changed, if you need more memory, more CPUs allocated, more disk space. What do you do? You have to submit another request. It might be self-service, but there's still probably an approval process there, and there's a timing thing. Well, with declarative intent, we can put people in a namespace that has certain quotas associated with it. They can deploy what they want to their heart's content in that namespace, use their resources, and reshape their, the infrastructure that they're running their application in up to their quota. And the quota itself can be a little bit easier to enable self-service for works very well, again. Resizing services. In a typical deployment with VMs, if you add another VM to the service, you have to contact that load balancer team again, have them add the IP of the VM to the load balancer for that application. It's not a seamless thing. It's not quick to do. With auto-scaling, that happens naturally, built into to Kubernetes. Control plane visibility. This is a, another really interesting one for us. Um, if you think about a typical infrastructure in an enterprise, many different components, many different vendors, um, getting all of that information in one place typically relies on another tool, right? You either need some kind of a SIM or a log aggregator to get all of that information in one place to be able to use, and even then, it's really never perfect, right? With GKE on-prem, all of the logs for the infrastructure that's supporting all of the applications that are running there are sent very nicely into Stackdriver over a tether. Works very well. Troubleshooting and logging. A, a little bit more like control plane visibility, but this is more on the application side. In a typical enterprise, it can be very difficult to give um, individual application owners access to metrics related directly to their applications. In Kubernetes and GKE on-prem, we have really advanced tooling with Prometheus and Grafana. It's very simple to create custom dashboards per application with RBAC wrapped around them. Individual application teams can see what they need to see to understand how their applications are behaving from a CPU and memory perspective, a network perspective, and we have Stackdriver for actual application logs if that is what's chosen to be utilized. Uh, you know, Inez mentioned that we've been working closely on a lot of this stuff, and we have, and I think that, you know, at the end of the day, all of the work that we've done together has created a really compelling package to have an enterprise deployment of Kubernetes that's really scalable. Uh, it works really well, and we're very happy with all the integrations that have been done so far. Uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Satya, who's one of the people that we've been working very closely with, and he's uh, been great with us working on all of the networking components inside the product. Thank you, Paul, and I have Scott joining me on stage, too. Um, so I'm gonna start out by thanking Paul and Scott because they've been working with us from get-go, uh, quantifying a lot of these problems and actually educating us a lot on 
what actually works. Because when we started GKE on-prem, we kind of recognized that you understand your network the best, right? Um, it's not the cloud. You have your own constraints on how you build the networks. You have your own constraints on what works and why it is the way it is today. And our goal here was to go in and actually adapt GKE and Kubernetes to work best in your environment with minimal overhead in terms of networking cost. Right? That was the way we thought about the problem. And, and, and HSBC has helped us a lot in actually making that um, work and making that actually um, doable in some sense. And so when we started out, what we did was uh, we had to start with some principles, right? Like how do we think about this problem? And we, and we did it in terms of, of these essentially uh, five or six principles. So the first thing we wanted to do was we wanted to support native Kubernetes constructs as much as possible. So we didn't want to go in and say, oh, because you want to expose something as a web service, go do this other thing after you deploy a Kubernetes service, right? We wanted you to be able to use Kubernetes ingress, right? We didn't want to make anything that was Google specific or GKE on-prem specific, right? We wanted to support Kubernetes uh, where it mattered. That was, that was like the grounding principle on which we, we approached the whole problem. The second thing we did was we didn't want to do yet another overlay. Like there are enough overlays in, in these network environments that we didn't want to do yet another overlay, right? Um, as much as possible. But in order to be able to support that and to be able to support multiple applications without having to expose IPs for everything, we decided to separate L4 from L7 load balancing and ship L7 load balancing as an inbuilt service within the cluster. So if you've used GKE or used any cloud, think about it as you kind of assume HTTP load balancing happens for you, right? Uh, and, and you assume there's a service that's doing that. We wanted to give you that same experience with GKE on-prem. So when you get, want to get started out, you shouldn't have to think about how L7 will work. It should just work, right? And the last thing is, having done the separation, we picked an Envoy-based L7 load balancer, but then decided to integrate with your existing L4 solutions in your network so that you don't have to kind of invent yet another technology for how you want to do L4, right? So these were the grounding principles of how we approached the problem, how we broke it down. Um, and, and as we, we look into the, each of the details of how we do control plane and data plane in the following slides, but those were the principles, and as you see uh, through these slides, you'll see how they actually play a role in how the solution evolves, right? The very first thing, as Ines was pointing out, was how the control plane itself tethers back to Google, right? So if you think about it, and this is one of the very first insights that we had, most people just think on-prem and Google Cloud, and they think it's two networks. But actually, we, we sat back and looked at it. It's actually three networks, right? There is your on-prem network. There is your Google Cloud network, which is your VPC. Uh, and then there is the actual prod network that Google's back services run on, right? And then there are three distinct networks. And you own, in some sense, your on-prem network and your view of the cloud VPC, right? It's your network, because it's your project. Uh, the other stuff is Google-hosted project, Google stuff, right? So when we wanted to tether in, we assumed that we will have to support multiple modes from get-go. Like I said, we wanted to adapt to what you have. So there's two ways that the tether will actually work. It could dial out through an egress proxy that you have in your network, assuming you're all closed networks, and then do an SSL tunnel back so you can get a secure end-to-end -end connection on how your control plane gets visibility on Pantheon and your Google Cloud. Or you could actually go in and if you have an interconnect, connect through the interconnect, which will route traffic through your VPC and stay completely private to your enterprise and never have to go to the public internet, right? So there's two modes that you can use to actually go in and register your clusters into the cloud so you can do all the management of your workloads, the marketplace access, and things like that. Now, what is it that is registering it, right? So what is the control plane itself looking like? So one of the things that we wanted to do is, why do we only tether a control plane back and not run the control plane remotely? We wanted you the ability to be able to manage and run the control plane even if you, let's say, lose internet connectivity, right? This is your on-prem network. As long as your on-prem network is up, you should be able to manage your clusters. And the way we did that is by A, separating the control plane from the user plane, running a cluster just for the control plane. We call this the admin cluster. We host the workloads for your masters, user clusters masters in the admin cluster. 
And then we let the nodes that are there for the user cluster run just the workloads, which is its own network. If you actually step back and think about it, this is exactly what you get in GKE. Google manages your master on GKE. You get a bunch of nodes, which is a user cluster nodes that you scale for your workloads. You get the exact same experience in GKE on-prem, except that the admin cluster itself is hosted locally. It's, it builds on the same concepts, and it's exposed as an L4 IP, and the user cluster nodes are completely for user workloads, and they just register back to the master to do their operations, and we make all the wiring work, right? Um, and this then says, essentially what it does is you run GKCTL to create a cluster. You, you get something in the admin um, uh, cluster for your, uh, for your uh, manager, and then you get all the workloaders uh, spun up, and we go in and give you a cube config file pointing to the master API, and you can just do kubectl apply at that point, and your workloads will then run on the user cluster. Right? So that's, that's the networking flow. And, and in order to solve this, we actually went in and had to solve a bunch of problems. Uh, and at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Scott to talk about it, it, Scott actually influenced a lot of these decisions on why they were valuable and talk about these uh, uh, choices. Great, great. Uh, so, thank you, Satya. So uh, as Ines said earlier, we have been working with them for about a year now on this. So when they first came to us with the product, it was pretty Google opinionated on certain things that didn't fit with what we need in the enterprise. One of those first things is that first bullet point, which is the static IPAN. So we also wanted to use our, our own load balancers. Still an F5, could be something else, but in order to use that the way we have to use it internally, we needed static IPs. Those are in a pool, so we can still kind of leverage them, I'll call it dynamic static IPs, so we can still scale out the clusters as needed. So it went from being DHCP based only into a option, so static, which is populated through a file. Um, so as Satya was saying, one of the big advantages we have here, when we started our journey on Kubernetes, we looked at every flavor you could possibly think of. If we were to do multiple user control planes for, say, business, we would have multiple masters all over the place. In this case, we have our single up there. All the user control planes, I think as Satya was saying, run inside there in their own namespace. And that has your API server, your etcd servers, and they are all in an HA mode. That eliminates multiple VMs that we do not have to create, maintain, patch, get IPs for. So down there, it's up to currently, I believe, 10 is what it's going to be sent to. Thanks, Scott. And that kind of wraps up how we thought about the control plane and essentially give you the same flavor of GKE's management on on-prem networks, giving the same separation of basically administrator management being independent of the user workload management to be able to do each of these independently, right? And now we'll take a start taking a look at how the data plane itself works. So you've got the cluster up, you want to deploy a workload on it, how do we actually expect it to work, right? Before we go into how the networking works, this is kind of like a context of the world we, we, were, we were trying to meet, right? You have your on-prem cluster, uh, and you want to deploy some microservices on it. And you want to expose it through some name. Uh, and clients in your network, right? This is not like clients out in the internet. In your on-prem network uh, are trying to access each of these internal services. And these services, in some sense, might want to reach outside the cluster to talk to, let's say, an existing data store or an existing backend service that you want to reuse and expose within the cluster. As we looked at this picture, there were like three uh, main requirements that bubbled up. The first is from a security perspective and from just an IP utilization perspective, the ability for pod IPs not being directly reachable from the on-prem network came out as something that's valuable, right? So if you look at a, a Kubernetes cluster, you're, let's say, what, looking at 110 parts per node. So you want to do a slash 24 per node, you want basically eight to 10 nodes, you now start looking at slash 20, slash 18 address spaces, and finding these contiguous address spaces start becoming really, really hard when you have disjointed address spaces. So by actually not having pod IPs directly exposed, you can reuse these address spaces and not worry about losing address spaces in your on-prem environment to actually bring up a cluster, right? You're, you're just using an IP for the L4 load balancer, and an IP for the nodes, and that's it. So it looks exactly like how you would deploy a traditional application, except that for that cost of a traditional application, you get a full Kubernetes cluster, right? So those are the first um, uh, drivers behind 
uh, our networking model. This is a starting networking model, which leads to the second point, which is essentially what I was talking about. Limited number of IPs exposed to an L4 load balancer. We recommend doing a wildcard DNS match. So essentially, you want to be able to do name-based routing instead of IP-based routing once your traffic hits the cluster. And finally, as, as Scott was also mentioning, we gave the ability to not just do DHCP, but actually a bag of static IPs that you can give to the cluster creation tool and say, manage my nodes IPs within this, which it lets you then pre-configure a load balancer if you want to use your own existing load balancer as a shared service, because you know what the backends are. You basically telling the cluster, use these IPs for the nodes, right? So that's the context behind how we thought about the problem. Um, Scott. So as Satya was saying, we, uh, or as Paul was also mentioning, when we have a new service come in, you've got to get your IP address, you've got to get your DNS, and something we didn't really mention is certificates for that service. Everything has to be encrypted. So with this model, as that you're saying, we limit it to like, three IPs So we're going to need off the bat. It can be expanded, but it's going to be three of the Envoy-based ingress controllers. So we use a wildcard DNS to come in, um, and from there we also use a wildcard certificate. So our developers can spin up anything that's going to be in a layer seven base and instantly have access to it. And they'll do this for a test site as well. Uh, so they'll have you know, site A do their work, site B, different selector on the ingress, and they can test out an application and cut things over uh, in a pseudo kind of uh, AB deployment. Um, and in the middle there, when we talk about the ingress, uh, it might be important to mention, Satya, that we're not stuck with just one. It does support multiple ingresses, so Envoy-based shipping with it, but if you want to put Nginx in there as well, you can do that for other annotations that you might need or other features for any other ingress controllers. Thanks, Scott. And, and in order to make that work, what we had to do was, how do we make the pod IPs in a way that meets the Kubernetes model, which, as Ines was pointing out, assumes a flat IP address space for pods within a cluster, which is if pod A wants to talk to pod B, you assume they can directly reach each other within the cluster. But we also said we don't want to expose pod IPs outside the cluster, right, uh, just to save on the IP space. So what we did is we essentially built a node-to-node -node BGP mesh, which announces the slash 24 that's allocated to each node for the pod IPs so that they become Basically, they don't, you don't need an overlay to route the pod IPs, right? The underlying network will actually route the pod IPs directly. But since we never announced the BGP routes outside the cluster, they essentially form what we call an island of IPs within the cluster. Uh, but then this leads to the problem that if a pod wants to talk to an external database, how will the traffic work? What we do is if your pod IP is reaching outside the cluster, but it's not intended to another pod IP, you hit the node boundary, we basically knack by the nodes IP on egress. Um, and that way, the return route will actually work with connection tracking, which essentially then gives you an island of a large IP space you can use slash 14 if you want that you can just reuse between each clusters because they never leak outside the cluster. And the only cost you pay is the actual node IPs themselves, which is a function of the number of nodes in a cluster. right? So this is the first thing. And now, given this cluster, we look at how the traffic flow works. right? The way the traffic flow works is, as Scott was saying, you start with a wildcard DNS entry that you mapped to an ingress service. Right? We ship an ingress service out of the box. If you go through a GKE on-prem install, it'll ask you what IP to associate for the ingress service. So you are actually telling the system what IP to use. But you can then configure your environment to say, here's a wildcard DNS entry that maps to that ingress IP. So let's say start out a.b.c uh, to make it a little more concrete. And a client wants to reach a service s1.a.b.c. Right? So the, Wildcard DNS in your environment that you configured once will basically point it to the L4 load balancer uh, on which that web was configured. The L4 load balancer will then use standard Kubernetes node port backends to send that traffic down to one of the nodes in your cluster to its node port, at which point, again, standard Kubernetes takes over, sends that traffic down to the Envoy part that we are running for the ingress service, um, which is essentially a subset of Istio's um, a pilot and envoy combination. This is for not sub traffic, and it hits that part. At which point, essentially, all of this is just control plate wiring. Envoy looks at the L7 headers, right? It looks at the host name, it looks at the path. You can deploy a standard service with a cluster IP, so which is these are IPs in the cluster that never go or, or reached out, and add a Kubernetes ingress object that says either a path based match or a host name match, send it to our service, and the envoy basically then proxies it down 
to your service. So essentially what this gives you is an ability to deploy services with names within the wildcard DNS name pattern without losing any, without losing any additional IPs for each service that you put in. And you scale out the service, scale in the service within the cluster, or let's say, as Scott was saying, your service itself could be Nginx itself that you want to do your own custom uh, configuration. All you have to do is to say, here's a host name match, send it to my Nginx, uh, Nginx part or service, and all your configurations will work end to end, right? So you can essentially scale out your system by having additional services come in and be able to route just by host names within the cluster, and your IP cost into the network is just that L4 ingress IP for 90% of your use cases, right? And we also recognize there are other use cases where you can directly use service type load balancer, but in most cases you shouldn't have to if you're just doing microservices. Scott? Yeah, an important thing about when this gets set up, uh, so those node ports, you might be thinking you have to statically assign those somewhere on the F5 to say, okay, if you're looking for this, you're gonna go down to this uh, pod over here on this node port. There's the F5 controller pod installed by default that handles all this for you. So when it does get installed, it's not you saying you basically just ask for a couple questions, a couple being like 20, but still. Uh, and it just goes off and deploys in about 30, 35 minutes. And at that point, your wildcard DNS will work. Um, you've got your pods running, your node ports running. Um, and as Satya said, you're saving all those addresses, which is a, it's a big win for us, uh, obviously at the scale that Paul showed you. That's a lot of IP addresses, and that doesn't count what's over on our load balancers, what's behind the scenes, or what's just internal to certain other clusters. So all this just helps our developers basically do their CI CD, go from nothing to a full app in 15, 20 minutes, whatever they happen to have, and everything's running. So this has been very well received internally by our application developers. Uh, just on the installation that we have installed for Kubernetes in general, we had probably about 115 unique namespaces within about two or three months of use. And uh, the, the feedback we're getting from people, all of our developer community, has always been positive and the speed. Um, but then, if you realize, if you actually sit down and think about it, routing inside the cluster we've assumed is free, right? So we've said we've created a mesh of all pod IPs, we've assumed all pod IPs are reachable, all pod IPs, which if you're a security person will start kind of causing some point of worry because how do I then protect? Because essentially we've said we want to have multi-tenancy in some sense between multiple services, we want to host it within a cluster. They're all routing through the Envoy point and how do we lock it down? And so recognizing that, and as it's stable space in most environments, we do ship network policies out of the box, right? So any service, any service-to-service, um, uh, -service, spot to spot communication, you can lock it down based on your intent, right? So you can say, for example, in the previous slide, you could potentially say, I have service S1, but that's only reachable, let's say, from the HTO service for the Envoy part and not by any other services in the cluster, if you wanted to, right? Or the backend for service one is only reachable by service one, and so even if somebody wanted to write an ingress rule that said expose it as a new name, network policy wouldn't even route the traffic down to that service, right? So these are supported out of the box, Scott. Yeah, the network policies have been a big uh, request from our developer community for alternate solutions in PaaS environments or even in full VM mode. And it's very difficult, especially in a full VM mode, to, to let a developer log in and say, okay, this server can only go to A, B, or C. So it's been something that we've needed for a very long time. And I know we have some of our security people in this room, actually. So I know this is something that they're very happy about. So it gives a developer the ability to configure this. It's just standard Kubernetes network policies, which many of you have probably seen. So you can control your ingress and your egress based on protocol, IPs, destinations. So this is something, like I said, we've been asked by a, a lot of our businesses on how am I gonna secure this. And I did mention on the previous slide that we have 120, 130 namespaces. So obviously multi-tenant is one of our concerns. This is something that helps to secure that multi-tenancy. So we can have only the applications talking to what they should be talking to. Uh, so with that, what we're gonna do I'm gonna hand it back over to Inez. Uh, Paul and myself will be available for any kind of questions that you have on the enterprise portion of this. And I think Satya and Inez will can answer some of the GKE-based portions. Thank you, Scott. Uh, as you see, there's a lot of passion in the team 
uh, there's a lot of knowledge. I just want to wrap up with uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, first, I want to thank you, the HSBC team, for their partnership. I truly mean this. We have been working on a solution that truly fits their uh, needs as an enterprise. And in doing so, we have ensured as well that we provide the most stringent, highly available, uh, secure solution that meets the enterprise needs. And we will not have been able to do that without them. Um, it's been, uh, a, a, you know, like relatively short journey for what this delivers. Uh, we've been iterating really fast. We have been leveraging, of course, a lot on the uh, technology, uh, knowledge, expertise uh, that we have in-house and really bringing all that goodness on-prem so that uh, this really gives you the solution that really mimics the um, Google Cloud GK solution that it's really um, kind of the state of the art for a managed Kubernetes uh, solution for enterprises.